Good evening. So thanks a lot for coming so numerous to this uh, campus uh, lecture. It's really great to see so many people. We had uh, two weeks ago uh, another conference on agroecology. I, th I think some of the ones that are here were there as well, but I can see the age has dramatically dropped since last time, so it's really great to see you all uh, here. So uh, we go from agroecology, oh, it's gone, to agro, uh, agriculture of animals today with uh, Tobias, which, uh, who I'll introduce in a minute, but I just want to say a few words of, of context. So uh, last time we heard that 30% of the carbon footprint is related to agriculture. Um, but what's ironical is a lot of the stuff that we grow, we actually grow to feed animals and, and we bring down forests to do this. And then we use what we've grown to feed animals that we're gonna eat. I mean, something is very absurd in, in, this, whole th in this whole thing. And uh, also we hear, hear a lot about the wars and we're against one country invading another, but that's actually what we do on this planet as humans, we do as if this planet is ours and we actually don't find that such a big problem. Um, and of course it is and we'll hear much more about this uh, tonight. But the, the, the animal, thinking about animals also brings us to the notion of ecosystem that we discussed also two weeks ago. Uh, and the notion now of what people call one health is that you cannot be healthy as humans if the planet is not healthy. And this goes to the animals, this goes to the plants, this goes to the, the, the trees. And um, we're always, we're permanently confronted to this problem, yet very few people actually integrate this. Um, is that a lot of the diseases, whether it's the COVID, whether it's the flu, um, the tick encephalitis, Lyme's disease, things you hear about all the time because your, your friend, your sister, your uncle gets these, they're all due to uh, animals and the change in the habitat of these animals. So. Um, all these problems are connected. It's connected to food, it's connected to agriculture, it's connected to biodiversity. And therefore I think it's very important that we have these discussions here at EPFL. So tonight you have a great program and I'm saying you because unfortunately I'm not gonna be able to follow it all. We'll first have Tobias that gi will give a presentation. Then we will have a second presentation from Alice. Uh, then you will have a quiz. I'm not sure what it's about, so you better listen. I don't know, I don't think the quiz is on, on the conferences. And then Gary will animate a round table the discussion. And then maybe the best part is you're gonna taste all kind of nice and interesting food. So just to introduce uh, Tobias, um, he has, uh, he's the co-founder of uh, Pro Veg International. Um, and he's a writer, he's a, uh, a teacher, and he's what's not on the slide, but what's in the program, he's an activist. Okay. So when you say, oh, we're going to have an activist as a conference, um, a lot of people that are much older than you will go, oh, an activist on campus, this sounds scary and terrible, and you think you're going to get the prototype of what used to be a hippie, but in the modern version. But no, you get somebody that is very well read, very well documented, that looks like any of, of you, and the things have changed from, ecologists used to be the dreamers that nobody listens to, and these days they're the only people that actually think about the different problems. So he has managed to, to make of ProVeg a, a real political power that interacts with the UN in all kinds of different programs that are related to climate change, also the implementation arms of these uh, conferences, and this has given a lot of credibility and a lot of impact and I think also to his books, and I'm really looking forward to your talk. So thank you very much for coming, and we look forward to hearing you. Thank you very much for the um, introduction. Thanks to the um, EPFL and the organizations hosting this for inviting me, and thank you all for being here. So I'm going to talk indeed about the problem that is 
agriculture, or animal agriculture, and I think, and I will explain this later, why it's a wonderful problem. I've already been um, introduced, uh, just let me add that I am from, um, from Belgium, from a small uh, city, well, actually the countryside in Belgium, we also have an animal sanctuary there where we care for a lot of animals from the farm industry, you can also stay there, that's our web address. Um, so that's where I uh, come from. I'm going to talk to you um, in the form of um, a story, and I'm going to show some stills from a video that is actually a commercial for a meat alternative. And it begins with some inconvenient truths. This is David. I'm just calling him David, but David is a big man, a manly man, and you know maybe that the manly men are not particularly open to eating less meat. And David isn't either. He is in his truck, in his big manly truck, and he's listening to the radio. And on the radio, there's a news item. And this news item is saying something about the negative impact of meat on the environment. And can you guess what he does? When he hears this, he changes the channel. He doesn't want to hear that. These are inconvenient truths for him. And there might be inconvenient truths for you too, and I'm going to go over them. So I'm going to, over, go, going to go over what David doesn't want to know, and maybe what you don't want to know. You may not want to know, but still you're here. So that's already a great start. So this is the problem of animal products, the products that we eat. And they are happening or situated in three different domains. The first is environmental. So, for all major environmental problems, animal agriculture is the first, the second, or the third cause. There's no environmental problem that, or no big one, that animal agriculture is not implicated in. And it starts with, obviously, global warming. Animal agriculture is responsible for 14.5% of greenhouse gas emissions. That's more than all transportation, including planes, combined, right? And maybe you know that this is in part due to the famous farts and the burps of the cows that emit methane, but it also comes from um, land use changes. We'll get to that in a bit. But what's really important is that while it's responsible for 14.5% of all greenhouse gas emissions. What we are spending on it, in terms of the percentage of all the money that we spend on combating climate change, is just less than 1%. Less than 1% of the money that we use for combating climate change is used for reducing meat consumption or changing animal agriculture. And yet, it is one of the most efficient things that we could do. In terms of millions of dollars spent, it is one of the best interventions. So, other than those burps and those farts that I talked about, one of the main causes is, of course, what we call land use changes, changing forest into pasture or changing forest into fields where we grow animal feed. And if you look at the surface area, that we need or that we use in the world today for the production of meat and dairy and also for the feed for those animals, that is a surface area that equals the surfaces of the continents of South America and Africa combined. I find that a staggering statistic. And of course, one of the consequences of that, of transforming all that land, all that forest into pasture and into soy fields for animal feed is that there's a huge loss of biodiversity, another big problem. And you know maybe that of all the mammals today, most are either human or they are livestock. And only 4% is wild. And all, of all the birds today, a minority is wild and most are the chickens and the turkeys and the ducks that we eat. That's what we've done because of animal agriculture. Two solutions that are bad solutions. The first one is to shift from red meat to white meat. I see this happening more and more. Recently, a menu from a certain caterer, there were no beef options. It was only either vegetarian or chicken. 
people, organizations, companies, governments do this, the shift from red to white, because white meat, chicken, and fish emit less greenhouse gas emissions, right? So in that sense, it's a good thing, it's a good shift. But it's a bad shift in terms of animal welfare. Why? Because first of all, those chickens are treated worse than the cows and the pigs. And secondly, because those animals are much smaller. If you want the same amount of meat that you get from one cow, if you want that same amount of meat from chickens, you need 250 chickens. So that's 250 times the suffering, 250 times the killing. I'll get back to that in a second. The second one is focusing on, lo on local foods, on eating locally. And you may have heard of that from your local government, your university, your work, whatever. It's a very popular intervention. Why is it so popular? I think it's so popular basically because it's so uncontroversial. Nobody will complain. No farmers, no politicians, no consumers will complain about the initiative to eat more locally. But the thing is, it doesn't do very much in terms of climate change, right? This is a life cycle analysis of different products, and you see there at the top, you see transportation in red. So you see in those lines what is caused by transportation, what part of the greenhouse gas emissions is caused by transportation. And then you see over there this little red line. That's all. That's what transportation in this case is responsible for. So yes, we might do something about local foods, etc., but we have to look at the priorities. And I'm not saying don't do local foods, but be aware that there's other more important things. The second one, second field, which just creates problems, is health. We have the strongest evidence for the link between red meat and processed meat and cancer. That's quite well established, but there's other problems. Cancer, heart disease, obesity, etc. they cost a lot of money to society, especially with, an, with a graying population, an aging population. I don't think even Switzerland is going to continue to be able to afford that, right? So what we have to do more and more is prevention. Instead of curing these diseases, prevent them from happening, and we do that among other ways, through food. One study in Germany said that 30% of health cost was caused by an overconsumption of animal products. Don't know if that's true or that will be confirmed by other studies, but that is really serious. One problem that is not manifested yet, but that could be a really big problem in the future, is um, antibiotics resistant bacteria, right? Bacteria that will be resistant to antibiotics because we're using so much antibiotics in the meat industry. And that could lead to a future where even the most common diseases cannot be solved anymore by the present-day antibiotics. And as was said in the introduction, pandemics and general infectious diseases, three out of four infectious diseases today come from animals. That is because these big hangars where we um, Raise animals are fertile breeding grounds for mutations, and also because by encroaching more and more on natural land, we come into contact with more and more organisms that might be dangerous to us. And thirdly, the third domain is the one that is most close to my heart, is the animals. And usually, in talks about sustainability, we don't talk about the animals. We usually talk maybe about extinction, extinction of wild animals, but we just ignore the millions of animals that are being slaughtered for food. That is apparently not a sustainability problem. These are the millennial, go the sustainable development goals. Animal welfare is not part of that. There is number 14, life below water, the fish, but that is just about making sure there's enough fish in the ocean so we can keep fishing. It's nothing to do with animal welfare. Right? So I don't want this to be ignored. Why? Because the scale of this problem, the scale of this suffering is so incredibly staggering. These are just numbers about the animals that we kill every day for food. Every day, 200 million chickens or 1 million cows every day. And even if you think that killing them is fine, 
as long as they have a good life, and most people think like that. Most people say, we can kill them to eat, but they have to have a good life. Then I want to ask you, do they have good lives? The suffering of animals and the mistreatment and exploitation is very structural. It is not exceptions. This, for instance, manipulations, this is where we shape an animal so that it fits into our system. We change their body so that it fits, that it's convenient for us. This is debeaking so that animals don't peck at each other because they're so close to each other. This is a female pig that is locked inside this crate for almost half of her life so that she won't trample the piglets. It's an unnatural system, otherwise this wouldn't be happening. Fallout is the phenomenon where we have animals that don't even reach the slaughter day. They just die before that. For instance, chickens that get too weak, they can't reach the food or the water anymore, and they will just die of hunger or until some human kills them, euthanizes them, shoots them, whatever. There's also emotional suffering, I think, or emotional aspects involved. This is something you never see on an industrial farm, a chicken with a chick. Does it mean anything for a chick to come out of an egg and to be entirely alone? To have nobody to love her, to have nobody to guide her, to have no mom ever? Does it mean anything? We don't think about that. I think it's probably very impactful for these beings. There's the problems of transportation, which are often horrible and painful, and there's slaughter. And many animals don't get su sufficiently stunned before they're being slaughtered. So many of them are being killed while they're fully conscious. That is not, well, that's an exception in relative terms. It's one or two percent, but in absolute numbers, it's millions in every country every year. The structural problem here is that we want cheap meat, and to have cheap meat, we have to raise animals and fatten them up as quickly as possible, because every extra day means extra money, extra costs in terms of heating and food and water and cooling, etc. So we have to have breeds that get as big as possible, as fast as possible. And that's what we've been doing with animal research, agricultural research, in the last decades, we have animals that grow very fast. Do you know how old an animal is when you have it, how old a chicken is when you have her on your plate? It's six weeks. In six weeks, she is entirely fully grown. She's actually a very young animal, but she has an adult body. If you would make the comparison with humans, you would have an eight-year-old boy who looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger, something like that. Okay, and of course this growth, this fast growth, comes with all kinds of problems, like for instance, problems with the joints. We have turkeys at home, which come from the industry, and we know that at some point we will have to euthanize them, because at some point they will no longer be able to walk because they're too heavy. That's the kind of thing that happens. And still, I call all this a wonderful problem, like the title said. It's a wonderful problem because if we tackle animal products, we tackle so many things at the same time. So it's a wonderful opportunity to do something good in this world. All these effects at the same time. If you look at where we come from, we've seen animal consumption rise over the last 60 years. And you may think that these meat substitutes are everywhere and everybody's going vegan. Well, if we will see a business-as-usual scenario, then it will look like this. Demand still increasing, mainly because countries like India, China, etc., are getting richer and therefore will eat more animal products. And if you look at the market share of meat alternatives worldwide, it is this big, less than 1%. So we're nowhere yet. Basically, so don't think that everybody is forcing you to go vegan and everybody's going vegan. No, it's not happening yet There's good evolutions, but there's a lot of work to do Let's go back to our boy here our man David and let's psychoanalyze them So he doesn't want to hear what's on the radio. Maybe you are already Making up excuses about what I'm seeing here but basically David is a stakeholder he has a stake in things continuing the way they are. He likes to eat meat. 
It would be more correct to say he's a stakeholder, actually, right? Just the way everybody who likes to eat meat is a stakeholder. And it's hard to think rationally about these products when we are so hell-bent on continuing to eat them. Can you understand how we think with our stomach, perhaps, or with our tongues or taste buds? That's what happens. And so what we experience, what you're experiencing now, many of you, I guess, is something called, as you may know, cognitive dissonance. The feeling, an annoying feeling in our head that we have when our behavior and our beliefs clash. They're not aligned. You may, for instance, be eating meat, but your belief is that, well, yes, the animals are really mistreated in the system, so I shouldn't. So what are the solutions to that? The solution that people use to reduce the dissonance, either they close their eyes, some of them, a minority, adapt their behavior to what they believe. They say animals suffer, or this is important for the planet, so I'm changing my behavior, I'm becoming vegan, or at least I'm reducing my meat consumption. Most people do the opposite, they will adapt their beliefs to their behavior, and they will invent excuses, like maybe some of you have been doing already in your head. I hope not. So they will say things like, it's normal, and the animals don't feel pain, and it's fake news, not true, etc., etc. So what do we need? Well, David comes home after work, and his wife, it's a bit of a traditional situation, has cooked for him. And she has cooked that meat alternative that is being advertised in that commercial. And he takes a bite of it, and he says, Mmm, it's delicious. And his wife has put the packaging near, he's apparently emancipated enough to do the dishes. His wife has put the pa packaging there, and he picks it up, and he's interested. And maybe next time, you can imagine that he doesn't change the channel anymore. Why? Because he's had a good experience. Because he's seen that there's an alternative. And because now he knows that maybe there's nothing much to lose anymore. So. Most people, when they want to change behavior, they go in this direction. They want to change people's attitudes, and then they hope there will be behavior change. And sometimes it happens like that, but we also have to go the other route. We can change behavior. People change their meat consumption, for instance, for whatever reason, to whatever degree, and because of doing that, they're all of a sudden more open to change their attitudes. What we need is not this situation, a situation where alternatives are hard to find and are expensive and are not so good, because then the effort that is required is quite high. We need this situation. Alternatives everywhere, really great. This is, this is about everything. This is about environmentalism, sustainability, etc. Alternatives have to be great, and then people don't have to put in all that effort. Most people don't want to put in much, much effort. I became vegan 25 years ago. I was prepared to make the effort. Even today, people are still not doing it. So we have to create a food environment that is conducive to change. And that starts with producers, and Alice will talk about that more, producers who use today all kinds of technologies to produce new meat alternatives that are getting ever better and that are getting more and more indistinguishable from meat. And we could have, in the end, technological solutions for moral problems, right? These are cases where animals were used. Technological solutions make sure that it's no longer necessary at some point. So that is part of the strategy. Also, restaurants and caterers and food service is important. This is Burger King in Austria, I believe, where people were asked when they ordered a Whopper, do you want a normal one or one with meat? Normal one or one with meat, normalizing the plant-based option and making sure that meat isn't so normal anymore. IKEA here, IKEA is one of the front runners in this space, uh, making the hot dog, the vegan hot dog, cheaper. Lidl is the first supermarket that actually says we're not just going to try to increase our plant-based sales, we're also trying to, going to try to decrease our animal sales, our meat sales, because if we don't do that, Nothing is won, right? The environment hasn't won, the animals haven't won. This is Penny, a German supermarket that puts the true price of products next to the announced price. True price means 
where we include the costs to the environment and to health. Back to our guy, David. He's not vegan yet, but he is our man. Why? He is important. I don't care that he's not entirely, I would wish him to be entirely vegan, but he plays a very important part in this because he drives up demand as soon as he starts consuming these vegan products. It's a bit like the gluten-free thing, right? Gluten-free became really big, became interesting and became offering to, I mean, there's good products that are gluten-free, not just because there's 1% of gluten-free people, but because there's many people who are participating in the trend, right? And that's why a lot of products were made. And this is the same thing with the situation. Small number of vegans, but a much bigger number of reducers. Maybe you are, you are a reducer, right? And it's thanks to reducers, basically, that there's such a huge amount of products to choose from now. So they're strategically important, and we know from research that the people who buy meat substitutes also, in the most cases, buy meat, and that most of the meals eaten, the vegan meals, for instance, in the UK, are eaten by non-vegans. So this thing now is everywhere, and the problem is now that the meat industry has noticed and is fighting back. So back to our man. He's tasting it, and now all of a sudden he has doubts, and he says, this is processed food. Have you heard his criticism on meat alternatives? It's highly processed, it's ultra-processed. This is, in part, these meat alternatives could be healthier, but this is, in part, pushing a, a narrative that's being pushed by the meat industry. Just like there's other narratives, it's woke, for instance, it's not doing well, it's the end of meat substitutes, meat alternatives, the hype is over, uh, like, this article says, and we have to admit that they were maybe overhyped. We were too early. We were expecting they would go like this, and the growth is now a bit slower. But still, there is growth. This is the biggest meat producer in the world, JBS, who is investing 60 million euros in um, a center to make, or a production site to make cultivated meat, the meat from cells. This a ADM, Archer Daniels Midland, is investing 300 million in an alternative protein center. These people don't do that for greenwashing. These are serious numbers. Or Ernst & Young here predicting big growth for meat alternatives in the coming years. But just back to this industry, they are putting in more effort than ever, ever before to combat this whole growth. In the United States, the money that goes to lobbying for meat products, animal products, is 180 times bigger than the lobbying for the alternatives. And that has concrete consequences, this lobbying. For instance, national dietary guidelines in every country are heavily influenced by the industry. Or, for instance, you have heard maybe of this idea that we shouldn't call veggie burgers burgers or veggie sausages sausages. Right? That is the lobbying industry behind that, the meat industry behind that. Or the fact that Europe was going to revise all its animal welfare regulations and abolish cages, like the cages that the pigs are in that I showed you. But because of lobbying, this has been postponed now indefinitely. Subsidies in Europe, 1,200 times more sub subsidies going to animal-based products than to plant-based alternatives. How can you win this? How can you win this? Especially also if the media is biased and is under the influence of this lobbying. You may have heard farmers complain, oh, meat is being demonized and meat gets the blame of everything. But if you look at research, what some people did here, they analyzed 10,000 articles on climate change and animal agriculture was mentioned as a cause of climate change in exactly half a percent of the articles. So it's not being demonized, it's being silenced and tabooed, right? So I think that citizens like David need the government to help them. And a lot of people are against that idea. They say government should stay out of our plate. I think they have to help us because most people cannot do this alone. We are being bombarded 
all the time by commercials of or for unhealthy, unsustainable, uncompassionate foods. And our body wants to eat those. We are biologically determined to go for salty and fatty and sugary foods. That used to be adaptive. It's not anymore, but we still want that. So we can use help from governments, and they could do all kinds of things. Taxes and cutting subsidies to the meat industry or increasing subsidies for the alternatives, etc. This is what governments have spent worldwide in the last five years on meat alternatives, on alt protein, $1 billion worldwide. That may sound like a lot, but you can compare it to what one country in one year spent on the energy transition, the USA, $350 billion. So I think we have to convince governments to take this transition as seriously as that, and then it will be a total game changer. But in the meantime, governments are doing still this. This is a campaign to tell people to eat more beef. And it's funded, the campaign, the commercials are funded by the European Union. We with ProVeg have tried to um, criticize them and show this complete dichotomy. Europe advises eat less meat, advertises eat more meat. These are advertisements that we put in Brussels. And finally, I come to the last link in this whole story, NGOs and citizens and you. This is David one last time. He's going to make a baby tonight with his wife. And that baby, if she or he is born today, is going to be of the newest generation, the generation after you that we call Generation Alpha. And Generation Alpha seems to be already um, saying goodbye to meat. 21% to 34% doesn't eat meat of that generation. This has to be borne out by further research, but that is very hope-inspiring. Now, you could sit on your ass and say like, yeah, well, things are going to go going to be okay with this cultivated meat and this young generation, etc. So I'm just going to continue eating meat and wait till every alternative is there and it's all perfect. I wouldn't recommend that you do that. You have to help, I think, increase demand. So some of the things very briefly that you can do, first of all, change your consumption. And you can go as vegan as possible. You don't have to see it in black and white. It's not all or nothing. It's not because you're vegan that you are, that that is the only way to be part of the solution, okay? If you are reducing your meat consumption, your animal products consumption to a significant extent, you are part of the solution. Second one is to use your voice. Be an advocate, and you don't have to be the perfect vegan to speak out for these things, right? You can talk about it, you can do something in your community, at your university, at your job, wherever, and Take some initiative to change things, to change demand, to change the options. And one campaign is called Plan Based Universities, comes from the UK, and it is an idea to veganize or to make the whole offering of the food in the cafeteria at a university entirely plant based. Doesn't mean everybody has to go vegan, they can still eat whatever they want outside of that cafeteria. But this is a great campaign for a university to commit to sustainability objectives. And if you want more info um, on the campaign um, over here at this university, you just start it, then you can um, take a picture of this or ask the organizers of tonight um, how you can get um, involved. Thirdly, and this is maybe for later in your life, you can, well, you're Swiss, so maybe uh, already for now. Uh, so donations are also very important um, to support this cause. This is from my country. If I'm in Belgium and I earn 25,000 euros a year, then I'm, I have the median income. Median means half of the people earns more, half earns less than me. If I earn this median income, then I am in the richest 4% of the world's population. You will probably be in the richest 1% or something. And I am 21 times richer than the global average. So that is something to put into perspective our wealth, right? You're probably 500 times richer than the global, than the poorest in the world. And finally, and I speak about this because almost all of you are quite young, 
your career. This is the best way to make a difference. This is your life in months. Every dot is a month. This is from the blog, Wait But Why. And there it ends if you get 90, right? I am here, I'm over the hill, I'm 50. Most of you are somewhere here, right? And so you have a whole life ahead of you in which you can be productive. So you have to think really well about what you want to do with that time. Do you want to spend that time on inventing and developing and marketing and selling a solution to a non-existing problem, as most people do? Do you want to help optimize razor blades? How many iterations of this product do we need? When will we be happy with this? When will we say, stop, let's no longer invest in this? So many people wasting their time on things that we really don't need while there are such huge problems in the world and why are just terrible suffering. So please fill this in with something useful, with something beautiful. Thank you very much. Also, take the blindfolds off. Thank you very much, uh, Tobias, for that wonderful talk. Uh, hello to everybody here tonight. Uh, I'm Gary. I'm the co-founder and actual co still co-president of EVA, which is the Students' Association for Animals here on the campus of EPFL and of UNIL. We are co-hosting this event uh, tonight with the Alternative Protein Project. And next, here on stage, I would like you to welcome Alice Fauconet. She's the co-founder and the marketing director of the Swiss plant-based creamery company called New Roots. And she will talk to us about her vision and the vision of New Roots. You can come on stage, Alice. Thank you. First, I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. Um, we were speaking with Tobias yesterday in Geneva, and I said the same thing. Uh, it's unusual for me, uh, despite what I do, to be speaking um, in events that are organized by animal rights organizations. Uh, so it's a big honor for me. <laughs> um, this feels like a safe space. And I'm really happy to share my story tonight. Um, I like starting by asking a show of hands, uh, who already knows New Roots? Okay. Um, so I don't need to go into too much detail about <laughs> what, what we make. Um, our tagline is that we are inventing the traditions of the future. It sounds good. I'm marketing. I came up with that. Um, but also, I believe it's actually true, and I would like to explain what we mean when we say that. So, um, Neuroots was founded officially seven years ago um, by my co-founder, Freddie, and I. And I would like to tell you personally um, what is the story behind how Neuroots happened. So, 12 years ago, uh, I read an article that made the link between social justice as it relates to human rights with animal rights. I come from more of a social justice background. Um, I studied in Paris. I was very involved in different social justice causes. And I was one of these people who would very happily say, um, I hate vegans, and um, I don't think we should worry about animals until we have fixed human rights. And I stumbled, stumbled upon that article 12 years ago who said, if you exclude other species from the moral community, you don't understand justice. And I went vegan overnight. I had no idea how to go vegan. Back then, you really just have to eat plain tofu. I'm not joking. Um, and so I, Freddie, who was then my life partner um, and who was vegetarian from birth, um, got convinced, because I'm very convincing, um, that he should also go vegan. So we went vegan together 12 years ago. I'm French. He's Swiss. So cheese is something that we very much understand and something that we missed, uh, as maybe some of you relate. And um, long story short, Freddie was a professional athlete. Uh, he got badly injured, had a lot of time on his hands. And Freddie is someone who needs a project. So I told him I had a full-time job. I told him, maybe you can try making vegan cheese for us. So um, 
we, neither of us really have the mind of business people or entrepreneurs, so it really, it was something just for us at the start. And um, what happened is that we actually had pretty good results. Uh, it was, some of it was pretty rough. Um, but our friends would try and say, you have a product, you should try selling this, this is so good, and there's no vegan cheese. And truly, eight years ago, there was no vegan cheese. Um, and so we started selling small batches on the local organic shop in Thun, uh, in the canton of Bern. And even from older Swiss people, uh, we had really positive reactions. Being French, I thought people were just going to start yelling at us, but uh, Swiss Germans are a lot more civilized, and so uh, people were mostly curious. Um, and, and we had such positive reactions that it was a snowball effect, and the local organic shop started ordering the products, and it all started from there. Um, Today, Freddie and I still own the company. Um, we are available in thousands of shops uh, throughout Europe, mostly Switzerland. Uh, we have sold over 3 million products in 2022. We roughly doubled the amount of products that we sell yearly since we started. So, um, apparently most of you already know, but the way we do things is we don't use a bunch of additives to recreate the taste of cheese. We make cheese. Um, I'm not supposed to say cheese legally, but um, I trust you guys not to tell the dairy industry. Um, we make cheese using exactly the same methods of fermentation and ripening. The only difference is the milk. We make most of our products still from cashews, which I will talk about a little bit later, um, but from plant-based milk, we um, use exactly the same processes to make different cheeses and yogurts and creams. So our mission, um, because it started from an animal rights perspective, our, our first mission is to help people transition to a vegan lifestyle, and we're very open about that. Um, we think people should go vegan for, for many reasons, as Tobias explained, and we know that cheeses and, and I guess creams and just dairy products in general are very often, at least in Switzerland, at least in this part of Europe, the hardest thing to give up on. So for us, really, the idea is you keep your traditions, but we just, we recreate the same traditions minus the animal exploitation. So that's really the, the idea behind it. Um, I will explain the last point um, at the end of the presentation, but we are also starting to work with local ingredients to close the value chain in Switzerland, but the idea remains the same. It's recreating traditions that we all know here, especially fondue, raclette, are very important products. It's, it's not just about the taste, right? It's about the community, and so giving an option to keep this, this community aspect and keep these traditions alive is really what we're uh, interested in. We have a 1% for the animals initiative that we started four years ago, um, where we give 1% of our total sales, so not profit, sales, to uh, animal sanctuaries in Switzerland, such as Coexiste or Hofnar, um, and we also donate roughly 50% of, of this amount um, now to initiatives that help farmers transition from animal exploitation to growing plants. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but we have a, a production facility that we built ourselves. I did nothing. But um, Freddy, uh, who is a little bit of a superhero, is also a machine engineer. And so he put together, with the help of um, some Japanese experts, um, an energy ecosystem that means that we recycle and reuse all the energy that we produce. So for those who don't know, uh, this is our range made from organic fair trade cashew nuts. So we cover the basics like um, alternative to camembert, fondue, uh, fresh cheese, spread cheese, crème fraîche. And this is our product range made from Swiss local ingredients. Um, so we have um, a cooking cream, we have raclette, we have grilled cheese and yogurts. And we're always researching new products. Uh, the goal, obviously, is to cover all the dairy products. Uh, so these are the things that we're actively working on right now. So products like butter and milk are, I think, basics that are really important to cover in the near future. And I'm getting to the last point, which uh, is the one I'm always most excited to talk about. First of all, it's a little bit of a secret still, so you are 
amongst the first to know that we are actively working on a hard cheese, so obviously that is also made completely artisanally and traditionally. And um, this is where the, the working with Swiss farmers come into play. So uh, some of you might know of this initiative called transformation, so the word farm in transformation. Um, and that was started by Sarah from Hofnar um, and her partner, I mean, her business partner, Florian. And um, they have put together an extremely impressive system where they help farmers who approach them to transition from uh, animal exploitation to farming plants. And where we come into play is on two levels. First of all, we invest, as I said, money into facilitating this, so helping these farmers. Um, for example, helping them to um, analyze their soil and what they can grow on this soil, um, help them either keep their animals uh, alive and healthy without having to torture them and kill them anymore, or uh, put these animals in sanctuaries. And then uh, we come into play at the end as well um, by buying these ingredients and making cheese and dairy products with these ingredients. So the story, which uh, hopefully will be out next year, is that these farmers who are producing raw material to make dairy products are now still producing uh, ingredients to make dairy products, but in a vegan version. And so the hope for us is to tell a story, a very, very real and tangible story of what society is possible without being naive, because I feel like vegans are often called naive, um, a very real story of even these farmers having better lives. A lot of these farmers do not exploit animals because it's their passion. They do it because it's all they know how to do. Um, and so giving basically everyone a chance to have a better life and keeping the animals in mind, as Tobias said, um, the suffering of animals is the most taboo, and so I think we have to be able to talk about it, but more than that, we have to be able to give a tangible solution to a very big problem. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alice, for that presentation. Uh, before we move on to first the roundtable and discussion with our partners and then to the food tasting you are all here for, I know it, I would like to welcome a second guest on stage. I would like to welcome uh, Sophie Hanessian. She's the co-founder uh, of uh, Vegetables. Vegetables is a smart food consulting com uh, startup in Switzerland based in Neuchâtel, if I'm not mistaken. And what they do is they guide private and public organization in the development and in the implementation of what they call smart food strategies, which is food that is healthy, sustainable, and ethical. And I think she prepared a small quiz uh, for you. So, yeah, good. So, hello everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you. Uh, and yes, as um, Gary said, we are Vegetables, and Vegetables is a consulting and training company uh, based in Neuchâtel. Uh, and I am. I, I have one here. Sorry. Do you? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> hello. And we are also based in uh, Neuchâtel. And what we do is. Yeah, regarding all, uh, sorry, all the topics that Tobias and also uh, Alice uh, covered, uh, we try to help uh, society to change their food habits. Because now we have the facts, we know, but how do we do that? And that's what we do. Something very important is that everything that we say is based on science and peer-reviewed, so we would never be, yeah, feel, yeah, we would never feel comfortable to say something that we are not sure. So, uh, we promote smart food. Smart food is healthy, sustainable, ethical, mostly whole food and 100% plant-based, of course. So here are yeah, some services that we, we already uh, have done. And uh, just to be 
yeah, a bit clear. So we started the company, yeah, the, the idea three years ago, but we um, uh, registered the company a year ago. And uh, already we, ha we are doing so many things and it's very interesting and, and exciting. But anyway, we can talk about this later. So, now, the interesting thing. Um, I think it's important to think about the impact of our food choices. Uh, we eat three times a day, so we can have a huge impact on what we do. So now, please, <laughs> take your phone, and we are going to play a little bit. Let me know when it's okay. If you can't scan the QR code, you can uh, go to www.menti.com and enter the code. Is it okay? Okay. Is it okay, everyone? Let's start. Great. Let's go. Wow, there is, ooh, <laughs> wow, so many players, well. <laughs> so all the correct answers gives a maximum points, so you have to be quick. This is a bonus question. What is the favorite fruit of the Swiss population? So you can answer on your phone directly. Great. Exactly. In Switzerland, we eat an average of 16 kilo per, uh, of apples per person per year. So, and we are very lucky because in Switzerland, we have a lot of apples, so that's good. And here are the results. Yay! So, I think everyone is uh, <laughs> it's good. So let's continue. Question two. If all human beings lived like the Swiss, how many planets on Earth would it take to provide enough natural resources? And please tap, tape sorry, the number on your phone. Maybe you already know this question. Yeah, time's out. And yeah, the correct answer is three. Yeah. Let's see the result. Okay. Nikolaus <laughs> is the first one. <laughs> Great. Okay, next question. Which sector has the highest environmental impact in Switzerland? Is it private mobility, housing, food production and consumption? And yeah, the answer is food production and consumption and consummation. So, as you can see, it's higher than uh, housing and private mobility. Usually we think that it's uh, the opposite, but no, the numbers are here. Okay, the results. Well... <laughs> Yay, Beyoncé is on the top. Bravo! <laughs> Okay, this is not the last, but the one before the last. So, on average, how many grams of meat are consumed in Switzerland per capita? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So the Swiss Confederation recommends to eat 240 grams um, of meat per week. Uh, but as you can see, we eat three times much, uh, too much uh, meat. So let's think about that. <laughs> and now the results. Whoa, Beyonce is still at the top. Perfect. Ready for the last question? There are proteins in meat, cauliflower, soy. That three. <laughs> Proteins are everywhere. And, um, sorry, maybe I think I missed one slide, but it's okay. And the winner. Yuppie! <laughs> Bravo! Beyoncé. Who is Beyoncé? So you win <laughs> a newer <Nuremberg> cheese. <laughs> Woo <-hoo. laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Great, so thank you very much for your attention. Um, and if you have any more questions, I would be very happy to discuss with you uh, later. Thank you, Sophie, uh, for that small quiz. Uh, I think I can welcome back Alice and Tobias on stage as well for that uh, discussion. You can take a seat. The last person I would like to invite for that discussion is uh, Christian Schwab. Please come here on stage. You are the executive director of the Integrity Food and Nutrition Center of EPFL, which is an interdisciplinary center that aims at being actually at the interface between EPFL and all other aspects of society, so the business, the politics, the communication, and the goal of that center is to maximize the social and environmental impact of all the science and all of the technology that is being developed uh, here at EPFL. Uh, I might sit down. Thank you all for being here. Um, you are all kind of involved in promoting change in a general way, each of you in a different sector and each of you also at a different a scale, I would say. Uh, I'm gonna just ask you first as a small uh, round, also for the people that have not uh, talked yet, what are the specific challenges you face in your sector of the change promoting and at your scale maybe I can start from the other side with uh, Sophie. You have a mic at this position. Here, what are the specific challenges you face in what you're doing, in going to people that have their culture, that have their habits? And uh, a more specific question I would like to, to ask is you are doing consulting, so you're doing advert, uh, not advertising, but you're advising people. But I know, for example, in Switzerland, one big institute is the uh, Société Suisse de Nutrition, so like the Swiss Nutrition Society, which still, in the latest version of the, their report in 2020, they still advise, for example, three times dairy a day. So how do you how do you go around that? How do you? What are the challenges you face? Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. Um, so as I said, we started vegetables. Uh, now I can say really on business a year ago. And uh, the fun fact is that we never had to take the phone to call clients. They all came to us directly because we, we had this chance to, um, yeah, to meet the right people at the right time, especially in Neuchâtel. So we had the, the chance to meet the president of uh, the city of Neuchâtel. And he was able to introduce us everywhere. And now we are yeah, working with quite huge clients uh, in Neuchâtel. Anyway. Um, what, can you repeat again the question, please, because... Challenges. 
the uh, challenges, the challenges you face on a day to day basis. Challenges. Working in Switzerland, yeah. working at a small scale, you do consulting, but probably you yeah, do, yeah. don't do consulting at Nestle yet. So who do you consult and what is their vision and the state yeah. of the art? You see, uh, the challenge is quite now is that uh, we need to, to prove that uh, plant-based food is very good at any stage of the life for anybody, which is not what the Swiss and Nutrition um, uh, yeah, uh, Society say. And um, this, we also approach this uh, by using the word smart food and not vegan. And with this, we totally uh, can see that people react in a very positive way when we use smart food because they think it's not like too <laughs> strong and most of the time they come, ah, oh, okay, ah, oh, you're not vegan. And we just say, no, no, you know, vegan is a lifestyle. Uh, no, we promote smart food, the best food that you can uh, eat for your health and for the planet. And yeah, we have to, to work a lot on the communication. Thank you. Yeah. Smart food really sounds like a very catchy, very in the tone of 2030 word. This is a word I would totally see EPFL using in its communication. You are, <laughs> it, it, I mean, it's catchy. It, it speaks to academics. It speaks to, to business. Uh, at the Integrative Food and Nutrition Center, what are actually your activities also maybe to get known by the people? I know you don't do direct consulting. You don't write books. I don't think so, at least. You don't produce cashew-based cheese. So what are your activities and what are your links to Switzerland in general? Thank you, Gary. So the, the food center at EPFL, the mission, and you, you, you said it briefly, is to maximize the positive impact of the school on the transformation of the food systems. Um, so in that capacity, we establish connections between the scientific capabilities of the school, namely the labs, the professors, and the outside world to see how we could jointly develop the future-proof solutions. It could be related to alternative to single-use plastics for the packaging, could be in connection to protein alternatives, or the digital, digitalization of the food systems to reduce chemical entrance. Could, could take different formats. Uh, it's actually pretty broad, but that's what we do. Could be either with industry or we can also establish, and we, we work a lot on that, more purely academic projects. Like last year, we established uh, or we launched um, a 3.2 million project around the true cost of food. It was mentioned also by Tobias, uh, which is really about how can we reflect and internalize into the price of food items their true cost on society, be it through public health or the environment. Animal welfare is not yet quantified, but that's, again, the big missing one. And, and that particular project, for instance, includes six academic institutions. So it's a it's pretty significant projects to put together. So that's what we do at the Food Center. You ask the question, what is the major challenge we are facing? Inertia and lack of sense of urgency across the range. And institutions like EPFL has not yet fully grasped the, the magnitude of the challenge, the complexity, the urgency of the challenge, which translates into limited resources mo being mobilized for, for food transition. Political level, there, there is no sense of urgency around the political elite, the legislators, consumers. There is an evolution, clearly. People say, yeah, yeah, now I get it. We need to change, but not me, not my life. Don't tell me what I'm supposed to eat. And this inertia, this lack of urgency, is, is the single biggest limiting factor in that transition. Thank you, Christian. Uh, to you, Alice, you, would, uh, you have your own mic. I think it's, it's going it to be on? on. I mean, that's the person over there doing that. That's not me. <laughs> um, uh, you would, of course, benefit from more consumption, cons consumers' awareness. You would benefit from schools actually presenting your product. But one major challenge is your product is still in supermarkets, so it's still next to a lot of other products, most of which are at some part of the uh, pr uh, production chain being subsidized heavily, which your products are not, or maybe not that much today. In terms of marketing and of the price of food, how you deal with that here in Switzerland with the products you do? Yeah, I was going to say um, there is a very big challenge in telling individuals that they have to change a big part of their culture. But the biggest challenge for us has always been 
going against huge corporations and a whole system that is set up, as Tobias explained really well, uh, to keep animal exploitation alive and well. And so um, when we talk, well, in spaces like this or one-on-one, -on -one, um, we usually get a very positive response from individuals who understand the stakes and want to make a change, even if they don't decide to go vegan overnight, usually they're interested enough to, to try to do better. Um, but we exist in a capitalist system that um, entirely lies on profit. And so um, our biggest challenge, as you said, is that we have absolutely no subsidies. Um, but more than that, we have a whole system, a whole machine that works against us, as, expl as Tobias explained, is we are undermined by huge corporations um, that have literally billions to invest in marketing. And so we are still, you know, we, there's still a lot of adults who think that cows just naturally make milk and that we need to drink milk for, for calcium. So this, the brainwashing that has been happening for uh, dozens and dozens of years is still very much working now. So I think our biggest challenge is um, going against the whole system and we're still a very small company. Um, so it's, it's definitely, we are going to need change on a po political level. Um, but as I like saying, you know, we can't just wait for a revolution. We, we have to do as much as we can right now and it's worth it. Thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned that role uh, of big corporations. Of course, a lot of them are pushing towards getting actually back to meat or not developing the alternative proteins as a whole. But you've also mentioned, Tobias, some companies, for example, Lidl, that are doing some effort. As you said, Alice, in a, in a capitalist system, I mean, the companies thrive because they are invested in, and of course, the shareholders don't go in because of values. Uh, they go, go in, I mean, a company that does not make profit will run out and will go bankrupt even if they had good morals or good value. So what do you think is the role of these giant companies that do alternative protein and also other, other meat and dairy-based products? What are the pitfalls in maybe giving all of our money to them? And also maybe as a last question that we can come back after, the day it will maybe not be trendy anymore, not be that profitable anymore, how can we prevent these companies from shifting to a new trend or to totally reversing uh, their investments? Yeah, um, so I, I, I do think that there has been a lot of change and there's quite a few companies that um, have really or are beginning to understand that this is very important. And some of you, the anti-capitalist people, uh, may not like some of these companies and, and they're, they're the, the big names, the internet, the multinationals, etc. cetera. Um, but they are taking steps. Um, and I think that you can distinguish different categories of, of stakeholders here. You have the um, companies that um, produce meat products like sausages and, 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 and pizza with meat, etc. And you have also the, the retailers that sell these things. And these companies are kind of agnostic as to what they sell. If they make money, it's fine. And if that's a sausage, that's a plant-based sausage or an animal-based sausage, it doesn't really matter to them. They're not hooked on or are really committed to sell animal products. But there's this other sector in society, which is um, the farmers and the people that stand to win with um, the biggest amount of animals in society. And so these are the people behind the meat industry. These are the people who like sell fertilizers and pesticides and also animal feed. And so these, w these don't want to see um, the size of the animal population, the domesticated animal population, reduced. Because the more of there there are, the more they have to gain. So that is the, that is the biggest problem. And if you ask about challenges, um, I think these corporations are behind a lot of the PR that we are seeing these days um, uh, targeted at consumers, and I, and I can see all the time, I mean, you post something on Facebook about some new meat alternative, and people say, this is highly processed, you know? And this is just brainlessly imitating the narrative of these, um, of these companies that are lobbying, and, and, et cetera. And so, if you ask for the role of these other companies, the, the companies that are agnostic 
about whether they sell meat or um, plant-based products. They're doing already a job. They're getting together. They're understanding the situation. They are seeing the need for change in terms of environmental and sustainability, especially. Governments are seeing that need too. And now we're in a situation, and this is looking at positively, uh, we're in a situation where these companies, together with governments and together with NGOs, are all looking together to see how can we change the consumer. Because the consumer is not entirely really enthusiastic to go along. So it's funny to see that now we are working together with governments and with companies to see how we can do this together. That inspires me, that gives me um, hope for the future. Thank you. Most of the companies you mentioned on the talk or here are that make these alternative proteins are uh, still either doing no, uh, the Both. majority of the products they're making are not alternative proteins. And I don't, I don't know personally names of companies that are huge and doing solely these products. I mean, Neuroots, for example, is still in comparison with uh, other companies like Lidl or Bell, a small company. And uh, a few names that I know, for example, Alpro, which was uh, specifically making alternatives to dairy, actually has been recently bought by Danone, which themselves you all know absolutely don't do only vegan products. So is the destiny of every small company just being bigger and being bought by other uh, companies? What are the, the limits? And when you handle a small company, how do you deal with those questions? Maybe Alice and also maybe Christian on the side, you have a lot of contact with startups. Uh, you can also answer both to that question. Um, I, I don't have an answer. I, I don't know. Uh, I can just tell for us, we know that we would never sell to, we, we, we get interest from Nestle and Emmy, for example, and, and we know obviously we will never sell to Nestle or Emmy, um, but we also know we're not going to own New Roots forever and eventually at some point we will be ready to pass it along. And it's a real question. It's a question that Freddie and I sit down and, and discuss often. Um, again, we live in a system that, that very much uh, encourages huge corporations buying small companies that work well. Um, we know that it would be the end of the animal rights message for New Roots. Um, we know that we would be part of a green washing and vegan washing campaign for a bigger company. Uh, you, uh, we would only sell to a vegan company, but even then, the overwhelming majority of, of plant-based companies do not promote animal rights. So um, it, it's a question that I don't think there's one answer to. I think it depends on, on the honor of the specific small companies. But I think uh, as a systemic thing, yes, small ethical company, companies tend to be eventually bought by bigger corporations. So if, so if you want to keep your values a bit, as you said, if I might summarize uh, grossly like that, you need to remain kind of in control, meaning you need to remain at a certain size. If we want the eight, nine, maybe 10 someday million people in Switzerland and the huge population worldwide to be fed alternative proteins, we need to have a huge network of these small companies. How do you build such a strong and how do you accompany such a network? If, if I may ju just come back to the question, should we work with the big boys? The conundrum is that if you think in terms of impact, if you leave the good ideas to the good guys that work in their corner at a small scale and the big shots keep doing the wrong things, the impact is still going to be bad. So at some point, you need the mainstream large companies to be deploying the right solution. So at some point, the two worlds have to meet. But I know it's it's problematic, and there's probably a lot of people in this room that say, I, I will never work with Nestle, because they have been part of the problem for so long and probably are still part of some problems today. Yet, they have the route to market, they have access to the consumers. If we could get these guys to adopt the right solutions, the impact would be accelerated. So at some point, we need to find this, a way to reconcile these two worlds. Tobias made the point, they are driven by profits. Profits are defined by the current regulatory and incentive framework. That has to change. They have to, we have to create the, condu the, the, the conducive conditions where industry starts to make profit selling the right things and no profit selling the wrong thing, let alone be penalized for the wrong things. That will be the key accelerator to be, a, a drastic change in the regulatory and incentive framework that shows the way for industry to drive the right solutions. 
before coming to you, uh, to you, Sophie. So if if I think most be some people would at least object that if if Nestle hires paramilitaries to kill local farmers in Colombia to take their lands and to make soy for plant-based foods and not soy for cows, it would in the end matter a bit, but not matter that much. So how do we keep those huge companies that are worldwide, basically, and we can all admit it, over the lows, basically, how do we keep them in touch and how do we keep them in contact with uh, ethical and sustainable objectives and not believe, uh, and at still at the same time keeping being fully driven by profit, which is the way it is at the moment now? You might, three of you have Can something Can I say to, something real quick? So you <laughs> buzzing a bit. I give you the word after that, uh, Christian. No, no, but just to, to add, there was a lot of answer already in your question, but when you say industry, we think the Nestle's of the world. That, don't forget retail. Retail is always forgotten. We blame the Nestle's of the world for doing the wrong things. We blame consumers for having silly choices. And in the middle, there's the huge guys, the retailers, that have a huge influence. And they always get away with, oh, we're just the passers. We sell what people want. No, they don't. The two biggest advertisers in the country are Coop and Migros. And most of them are for products that have a terrible, mostly is meat-based, that have a terrible dietary profile. In their shops, in the recent years, more than 50% of the meat was sold on price promotions. There's a huge drive. So I just wanted to make the point. When we think meat industry, or, or uh, agri-industry is not only the, the, the food producers, it's also the big retailers that have a huge influence. You can, you can go, at least you have your own. I just wanted to say, I think we have to have the courage to think outside of the system that we live in. And like, I think playing by the rules of these huge corporations and playing by the rules of what matters eventually is the profit, it, it's true, objectively speaking, that's the world we live in. But I think we have to have the courage to dream a little bit bigger than that and to think that there might be like real solutions, real life solutions that we haven't even thought of it, uh, thought about yet. And I think that's a, a very important part of being a human being and trying to drive change is not playing by the rules of the people that are in power right now. So that's either politicians or, or these huge corporations, but everything you're saying is objectively true, obviously. Um, but I think, I, I think if we play by their rules, we're losing. And so I think we have to think that if, even if it's not true right now, we have to, to expand our mind enough to think that there are other possibilities, there are other solutions than, than just thinking if Nestle could fully go plant-based, then we would have advanced on what level? On a profit level, not on an ethical level. You know, the conversation about ethics will never happen on a Nestle level. And so I think we, we need to have the courage to, to think out of the box and, and dream a little bit bigger than that. Can I add Yes, of course. Um, I'm very sympathetic to, to, I mean, ideally all companies were idealistic like yours and, and, and carrying this message of, of ethics, etc. I also don't want to be um, vilifying all the big companies necessarily. Uh, just one example, um, in the Netherlands there was, um, there is, well, was, a company called Vegetarian Butcher, maybe some of you have heard of that. Um, so this, it was started by two people who are basically animal rights people, and they, their ambition was to become the biggest butcher in the world. And of course they couldn't do that by themselves, and that's why in 2019 they were acquired and they let themselves be acquired by Unilever. And I've spoken to the founders and they're really very enthusiastic about having been acquired by Unilever because Unilever is active in 192 out of 193 countries in the world. So they're everywhere now. They have, um, like you said, access to market. Like if you, if at some moment, which happened, Burger King decides to offer vegetarian vegan burgers, I think you cannot, I mean, suppose you would make burgers, you cannot supply Burger King. The scale is too big. So vegetarian butcher couldn't do that either, but it could do that with the help of Unilever. Um, there's all kinds of uh, R&D resources that can go into it. There's marketing resources that can go into it. It's only since recently, since big companies are interested in vegan products and plant-based because there's profit there, that you are seeing actual advertisements in the street, at the street level, for vegan products, which helps normalize this entirely, obviously. This cannot be done by small companies. So big companies do have 
big advantages, and we cannot do it without them. And ideally, in my world, again, it's all smaller companies who grow and grow and grow, but then at some point they will be big, right? Um, so we have to look at this not in black and white terms, at, at, I think, but, but also see the value that the big companies can, can bring. You still had something to say, Christian, or... Oh, you were holding a mic. Okay. Thank you. You mentioned that Burger King having now that uh, plant-based Whopper uh, burgers. One picture that always comes to my mind when I hear that is I see a family that has a, a vegan or a vegetarian child and that would like to go to Burger King and that they said, oh, but because we love and respect our child, I hope, uh, we would then choose to go you know, to, a, to a different, to a pizzeria, to a local shop where they have actually uh, other options. Uh, do you think there's a risk for big companies having plant-based options to just being able to get back this population and get back this market, this share of market that would otherwise have kind of to turn to more local uh, maybe somehow also more socially and environmentally sustainable uh, products. Maybe, Sophie, uh, a bit, you, you know about the consumers, you meet them on a daily basis, you advise them. How do you deal with these uh, habits and how do you, how do you prevent the, the veganification of our world to just turn every local pizzeria, every local restaurant into uh, a, a, a smaller version of a Burger King or a, a big company? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. What we promote is uh, a whole food plant-based because, um, of course, we can definitely go for vegan junk food and this is, uh, this is okay if people uh, need to go through this, I, I guess. But um, in the long term, uh, no, it's not an option. Um, and in my opinion, if this way can uh, help people to understand that, okay, it's, it's okay to eat uh, sometimes a burger from, a, yeah, a vegan burger from a, uh, oh, I forgot the, the name, but uh, from McDonald's or whatever. Uh, but it mustn't be the, the only, um, I'm so sorry, I'm a little bit tired. <laughs> but it mustn't be the only uh, way to eat, of course. And uh, we should definitely uh, inform people uh, differently. We, we have to go in kindergartens, we have to go in schools, we have to go everywhere to make them aware that there are also other possibilities than just go to a fast food and, and eat there. I don't know if I answered it correctly, <laughs> but uh, yeah, for me, in my opinion, it's okay, but it mustn't be every day. Thank you. I take advantage of the fact that the screen has gone black <laughs> to remind you that there was a QR code on it to ask some questions and to <laughs> up or downvote these questions. I am, in fact, trying to read these at the same time I'm listening to you and preparing my questions. I am indeed gonna ask some of these questions, don't worry, I'm just trying to find a smooth way to fit them into our, our uh, actual conversation. Sticking maybe back to you, Sophie, we haven't uh, heard you much yet. Um, when I see a huge company taking care of making products, obviously they carry a vision, uh, maybe they carry a business vision, they carry a moral vision, but they also carry just a cultural vision. Mm -hmm. and. If, if we see the vegan products, alternatives that are on the market, and also mostly in our schools, in our restaurants, the vegan options, generally, I know maybe the vegetarians or the vegan in the audience will agree with me, you have the vegan burger, generally, you have some kind of vegan wrap, you have vegan alternative to extremely mainstream, maybe junk, maybe processed, but also very cultural Western uh, food. How do you keep the local cultures with, if you, if you still rely on big companies to make your products, how do you ensure the preservation of local cultural traditions and to, to prevent their no, uh, normalization and the homogenization of food traditions in the world that we already see because of fast foods and burgers? At least you will also have a lot of to, to, to say about that probably. But uh, first, Sophie, how do you keep that thing? You work in Neuchâtel, I mean. Mm -hmm. How do you keep the traditions? How do you make uh, Pape Vaudois or how do you make a Tori, uh, a vegan-friendly version? 
and yeah. get people to eat that. The thing is that we realize that a lot of uh, professional cooks don't have the, um, the, the skills yet to cook a delicious uh, vegan meal. And um, what we are doing is uh, creating cooking classes for these chefs. So we are partnership, partnering, partnership, yeah, sorry, with uh, Gastro Neuchâtel, for example, to create a cooking lesson for the chefs. And with that, we really hope that they will keep this kind of food and not only offer burgers and uh, wraps and whatever, but they can also uh, diverse the food that they will offer, uh, especially for the vegan. When we go in a restaurant, it's, it's al always so sad to eat, I don't know, the, the salad or the fries. So this is exactly what we are going to do. Um, and uh, yeah. <laughs> Alice, you created a company and you went directly for the most iconic products of the Swiss culture and you tried to make a different version of that. Was that a plus? Was that a minus in your experience? And what would you advise uh, newcomers in the field to, to aim for? What Sophie said is really interesting. Uh, Rémi, who's here, uh, is a chef that we work with and who works here, obviously. Um, and what we hear from, from chefs, uh, if we're talking about the gastro sector, is that, um, as Sophie said, they usually don't have training with plant-based foods, and so they want a product that they can use one for one. So uh, we developed a crème fraîche, for example, uh, specifically for this purpose, that you can use exactly the same way. If you don't believe me, ask Rémi. Um, and so we... What we see, and I can only speak from the neuro's perspective, but what we see is that uh, it really facilitates the process if you can give people exactly the same product that they can use exactly in the same way without having to do too much education around it. So we're talking on a, on a gastro level, but also on an ind individual level. And um, I think that's why vegan burgers are, are so popular as well, as you're eating the same thing um, made from plants. And I, I think there's a lot of different avenues to get people to transition, but I think that the easiest one is to recreate the same foods with a similar taste um, that you can eat in the same way. Before the whole Neuritz thing, I studied sociology and I was actually uh, focused on food as it relates to migration, and food is actually the last thing that people give up. So um, if you migrate, let's say, from West Africa to France, uh, usually it will take many, many generations until um, people give up on their food traditions. So they will give up on religion before they give up on food traditions. And so food is an extremely emotional topic, which is why when we launched the fondue with New Roots, we had, a, I, we were not expecting this. It was like people had an emotional meltdown because they could eat fondue, vegans had an emotional meltdown because they could eat fondue again. And so that's something we take very seriously. That's why we're working on a hard cheese as well is because people are, very attached to their tradition, and it's not just the taste, it's also the community aspect of it. It's something that was passed from your grandparents to your parents to you. And so I think definitely recreating the same foods um, with a similar experience as far as taste, as far as community, is the easiest way to help people on that path. So this is also the answer to the much heard objection. Uh, if you don't like animal products, why do you want to eat products that look like animal products or taste like animal products? This is exactly it. Like you, you want to make the bridge between a product that people don't know and a product that people know, basically. Christian, you wanted to add something to that? M merely building on what has been said, but why are people going for burgers and why are the solutions today so processed and have so many ingredients? Because they, the producers, this, this incredible meat, wanted to be as close as possible to the meat equivalent experience. That's why, that's why they process their products so much. That's, how they, that's why they added so much ingredients to be as close as possible to facilitate the Davids of the world to go from a meat-based to a plant-based alternative without making any concession on the experience. So to your question, when will start, people start looking at more local solutions, plant-based, I think that will be the, the normal evolution. People went for burgers and sausages because that's where the money was. The moment this space will be crowded with competition, they will start to venture into new, smaller segments and eventually do their own experience. 
co come up with completely new experience plant-based, but as Alice made the point, the inertia for taste. Taste is something acquired. You like what you're used to eat. So it takes generations to shift to something completely new. If you were to put on the shelf something completely new today, it will absolutely have no acceptance by the consumers. It has to be a slow transition, starting from something as close as possible. There's, there's also this other aspect, like some of these companies, Impossible Foods, Beyond Meat, they are uh, founded by mission-driven entrepreneurs. They, they are people who want to improve the planet for animals and for the environment. And then what you're going to do if you want to have as big an impact as possible, you are going to imitate the products that are eaten the most. Like the chicken nuggets, for instance, it's one of the most eaten animal products in the world. So that is what you're going to try to imitate and replace. It's not the foie gras in the first place, right? It's, it's that product. So then you have the most impact. So that's also one of the reasons why companies are doing exactly that. Indeed, because I think most of us, if we think, uh, if we had the chance of having parents at home that would cook for us, I think if we make a list of five or ten usual meals that we would have on a daily basis, this would be actually very far away from what the from what the alternative proteins on the market are. I know for my part, if I travel to to France, then I go to a restaurant that does uh, specialties of, uh, I don't know, foie gras or whatever, and if they have a vegan option, it's a burger. And then I go to Italy, I go to a pizzeria where they make pasta and gnocchi and stuff, and the vegan option is a burger. And then I move to Germany and it's a burger. So basically the vegan option is a burger everywhere. How can we have also that cultural uh, shift? I think you mentioned uh, Remy, uh, who is a chef here at Native at DPFL, who does actually a, a lot of variety of traditional or new ideas of food, but that's not always the case everywhere. Do you have a booklet of recipes, or uh, how do you deal with that, Sophie? Do you do you suggest uh, to change the foods, or do you suggest to keeping and just replacing the ingredients? Yeah. So basically, if you use one <laughs> kilo of lentils compared to one kilo of beef. There we can talk about money, and uh, of course lentils is um, is very easy to cook, and we we go uh, to whole food uh, plant based uh, all the time, and we have recipes that we we create, and we can definitely see that it's simple, easy, cheap, and um, yeah, people need to to understand how it works, but it's the same when you go for shopping, for example. Uh, a lot of people are telling me, yeah, but I don't know where to buy things, uh, uh, whatever. And I think it's a routine that you need to, to implement in your daily um, routine, yeah. And, uh, and after that, yeah, you can implement step-by-step -step new habit. But I think it's also important to keep what you have at first and then introduce a bit more and a bit more and a bit more and not just say, okay, uh, uh, for, uh, from tomorrow I have to, to ditch everything. No, no, no. You just have to go and feel comfortable with what you eat and enjoy it. This is really important. Thank you. Before I go to the <coughs> last, <coughs> sorry, before I go to the last round of your last, uh, uh, your last words, I would, I hope not your last words, but you, you got what I meant. <laughs> uh, I will ask um, more random questions. Uh, they are more random mainly due to the fact that they have been asked by random people here. So the top voted question uh, on, the, on that link is the question, what would you actually say to someone that does not care about either the animals or the environment and to still convince them if they have completely uh, unaligned moral values? Maybe, to maybe Tobias, a question you must have kind of thought about sometime. Yeah, if, if they don't care about either of those things, then, then, then obviously the answer would be to see if they care about their health um, and say, like, look, all this overconsumption is not good for you, so you can try that. Um, but other than that, um, when people ask me, like, what arguments are the best to use, then usually I ask them, like, maybe we should take a step back and see if you need arguments. Maybe you can just work with food. Give them a really great vegetarian vegan meal, and then afterwards, like I explained, they might be a lot more open to listen to arguments or, or to discuss. So that behavior to, yeah. cognitive, to cognition and not the other yeah. way around. The second uh, most voted question was, is a vegan diet unconditionally recommended for kids? 
I don't think we have any dietitian or nutritionist among us. So I'm not sure if anybody is confident to answer that question. If you are, please take. I can, I can refer to an authority, uh, which is not me, but uh, there is the biggest organization of nutritionists and health professionals in the world, which is the uh, American and Canadian organization. And they have position papers stating that a uh, plant-based diet is suitable for all ages, from pregnant women to babies to elderly people, and does not only is not only suitable but can actually have um, advantages. So, thank you. I don't think I can ask all the questions, or I definitely cannot. Um, the one. Uh, largely upvoted question was directly to you, Christian. Is the EPFL working on more meat-free options? Also, these options should be the least expensive ones, which they rarely are. Uh, if the question was, are the scientists at EPFL working on plant-based? The answer is no, because we do not have food scientists. The closest we have, I'm gonna be technical here, one of the key ingredients for plant-based is methyl cellulose for the gelling, the texturing of it, which is a um, not friendly component from a labeling point of view. And people are looking for an alternative, a food grade, ideally plant-based alternative to methyl cellulose. So there the chemical expertise of EPFL could come in a very transverse way. So there are, there are marginal ways, but unlike Zurich, for instance, where they have food specialists, specialists of extrusion that are purely dedicated to this kind of work, we do not have specialists of uh, meat alternatives. Okay, and on a more school level, I think the question was oriented. Uh, what are the next changes that we're gonna happily see in our cafeterias? We know a lot has been rumbled in the uh, last years due to the mobilization of various associations here on the campus. It is stagnating a bit, uh, both on the side of uh, offer and on the side of prices. What's the next plan? What are the next steps? For those of you who know Bruno Rossignol in charge of the Restauration Collective, stagnation is not even in his vocabulary. <laughs> No, there's a lot happening. For those of you who might, because collective restoration, that is a canteen, is a very interesting space because it can be a little bit directive. In the market, it's very difficult to convince manufacturers, consumers. In the school, you can be directive. At EPFL, there's one constraining measure, which is a midday, meat-free day per week, right? There, people don't have a choice. They can go to Migro, but otherwise, it's pretty pres prescriptive. For the rest, what Bruno and his team, and Remy is part of that, they have created one plant-based restaurant, vegan and uh, vegetarian, which is uh, the native. In the other restaurants, they just affected the offer. Every second meal on offer has to be plant-based, vegetarian or vegan. By simply having this measure, and I'm not saying EPFL students are very representative of the average population. They, they could be a level of awareness and education is much higher than, than, than somewhere else. Yet, if in Switzerland, the average percentage of population, vegan or vegetarian, is 5%. At EPFL, 57% of the meals consumed are meat-free. 57%. Just by offering the right solutions, training was part of that. They have educated all the chefs. Some chefs were already fully trained. But all the other chefs were trained in doing that. And by offering attractive alternatives, 57% of the menus at EPFL are meat-free. Meat and fish-free? Meat and fish-free. Yeah. I will actually skip the next question. That was a question for uh, Alice regarding the future of the prices of new routes. Is it ever going to match the rest? Maybe you can answer that uh, quickly in your last in your last uh, <laughs> last round of taking the mic to speak. <laughs> and I will just go uh, to a last question, direct question for Tobias. Uh, what about insect-based uh, products? Yeah, so you might um, have heard that as well. A good question. Um, I would say. Um, we have enough options, plant-based, cell-based, whatever, options that are in the future also, not to go in the direction of insect-based. Insects um, or insect products might be um, interesting in terms of sustainability, but if we find, I mean, first of all, they're animals, but if we find out that they are conscious and they can suffer, and we don't know it yet, but it's highly likely that they are capable of suffering, and then if we have gone down a path of producing a lot of insect food, then we'll be dependent on it. And that will be, in terms of animal suffering, will be a massacre that's like a thousandfold bigger than, than what we have at present. 
So it's really a very bad solution, and I would, I would advise everybody to like not participate in it. Thank you. So we go for the last round. See, I did not get this one <laughs> incorrectly. Uh, and my question will be the same for all of you, but different. Uh, hear, me, <laughs> hear me out. The question is, what is the role of basically the sector you're, uh, you're working in for the future? So for your part, Sophie, you work in the kind of the schools or the social education to the population. What is the future of that and what it's, what it's, its main role? You have like a minute and a half. Let's have it quick. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we are here to raise awareness and to yeah, educate people about their, uh, the impact of their food choices and also to give them tools and inspiration to, to change because it's always simple to say, uh, yeah, there is an emergency, you have to change, you have to change, but most people don't know how to change. So we, we try to create the material, the tools and everything to help them to go in a smarter uh, way and uh, yeah, to, to change their habit like that. So you, Christian, what's the role of academics on a scientific level and also on a proof of concept and as, a, as, a, as an example, as a leader in those fields? I, I will quote the three missions of DPFL, which to me very much apply to your question. The first one is education. Like what we're doing tonight, like uh, some of the classes that are given in the Collège des Humanités that sensitize people about the, the nature of the challenges. Research, be part of the solution, be part of developing the future-proof solutions of tomorrow, and innovation and outreach through uh, the spin-offs of the school, through the entrepreneurs that the school will generate in the futures. Again, be part of the solution. And Alice, what's the role of these small companies? Do we need more? Do we need them to merge? Um, I still don't have the answer. You asked me the question 10 minutes ago. <laughs> um, we, we want to impact change in the food sector from, as I said, literally the soil, the actual soil. So analyzing the soil, what can grow to the end product and try to be as good and as ethical as possible um, with all the steps in between, which, in which include production, facilities and packaging and all of that. Um, we, we want to set an example, as I said, um, so we can try to think outside of the box and think that there are solutions that maybe we haven't even thought of yet. Yeah. And Tobias, as a concluding words, you said it in uh, another way, we need to scale up. We need products and alternatives and ideas to scale up. And for that, we have a reliance on higher, more organized infrastructures, economical fluxes. And that is, you said, mostly driven by uh, private companies. What is the role of public forces in uh, economic fluxes towards that and also in infrastructures? Is it maybe the, the time for a public service for alternative proteins? Well, yeah, if you ask the question about government, I already briefly talked about that, but they can do so much. They can uh, create level playing fields. They can. Um, make sure that there are uh, sens sensitization campaigns so that people become more aware. They can uh, levy taxes, they can cut subsidies, they can improve subsidies, increase subsidies. There's so many things that they can do, but first of all, they should understand the urgency of the problem, and they should also understand, and they should be given permission by the public to actually really um, help people, I think, in changing their dietary patterns. And, and that is something that right now, governments still don't have the permission for, um, but we have to start understanding that food is a topic like the energy transition, etc., and that it seems very private and very personal, but that is actually a very public discussion. So if we want people to travel by train, we have public services of trains. If we want people to eat alternative proteins, maybe one day we will have public production and selling and advertising of these products. I, th I assume these things will remain private. I mean, this is just a, the society that we are in, but I, I wouldn't be against <laughs> government producing food. Um, but um, present day, uh, these things are, are produced privately. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, I will uh, get the clicker that I've been handled 
handed in by uh, Tobias to go to the last uh, thanks. We are thanking these three associations who contributed to the night. So the first one, I introduced it quickly already. It's the uh, Association for Animals here on the campus of EPFL and uh, of UNIL. I am a co-responsible co co person of it. Tongi, who is there, is also, you can talk, us, talk to us uh, after that, we thank uh, the GFI and in particular the Alternative Protein Project of EPFL who help promote these alternative proteins. You can talk to Isabella who is uh, here at the end. And we would like also the Cooking Association of EPFL, uh, 180 degrees, we would like to thank them. They helped us a lot for the food you're gonna taste after afterwards. Uh, very last advertisement, we as Eva are organizing actually a whole event about what uh, Tobias has mentioned, which is the sentience, so that ability of animals to suffer and how much this matters and how much this is disregarded when you talk about food, when you talk about ecology, when you talk about economics, when you talk about a lot of political topics, animals are forgotten on the side. We are having a full month of events. So this was the first conference. There's gonna be a second conference towards the end of the month to understand what is the science be you said maybe someday we will know if insects can or feel pain or emotions, how the science of that works. We will have a sociologist, uh, spe uh, specialist of the science of sentience coming to EPFL. We will have screenings, we will have a uh, so-called cafe discussion open about the role of sentience and of uh, uh, animal consideration in ecology. You can uh, scan that QR code, you can co come talk to us. There will also be a poster for all the upcoming events of that month and you are more than welcome to attend. I know you go back to Belgium, but uh, those of you who stay in the neighborhood, thank you very much for you for coming this evening. And I think we can all move to the eating part. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. You did very nice.